Two unemployed actors. Two unemployed actors. They're just between projects. Welcome back to Two Unemployed Actors. I'm Max. I'm Sam. Today we have the pleasure of talking to Christian Van Vuren, actor, writer, director, uh, a multiple slashy, basically. Welcome to the show, Christian. G'day, boys. How you going? Good, good. We're surviving as up and coming actors have to. And uh, I think for us, we're one 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 thing that we've been talking about a lot is the Bondi hipsters. We just we have to start with the Bondi hipsters because it's one of Australia's biggest online success stories, really. Um, and both of us being based in Sydney, it's something we can sort of somehow relate to. Um, what what was going on in your life when the idea for Dom and Adrian came about? Um, well, I guess um, my brother Connor and I, we'd just come fresh off the back of winning the 180 Project, which was like an MTV kind of film contest. And um, we won ourselves a budget of 180 grand off the back of that to be able to make a pilot for a TV episode. And so we'd kind of spent the best part of a year working really hard, um, putting that pilot together, shooting it. We would just got through the back end of that process. Um, and one of the actors that we'd we'd worked with for that pilot was a guy named Nick Bosher, who at that stage um, we knew as Trent from Punchy um, and he'd done a bunch of kind of web stuff and we put him in the pilot and we just had a great time collaborating and working together. And so fresh off the back of doing that, I just wanted to keep the ball rolling and, and wanted to dive into something else. And um, I guess Bondi Hipsters just came, came kind of straight off the back of that. In fact, we started shooting Bondi Hipsters because another like another contest came up. It was run by Movie Extra. It was called the Web Fest. Right. And you had to make a, a 60 second trailer for what your TV show concept would be. All right. So we kind of, we did a weekend of shooting um, where we kind of had this scripted 60 second trailer for, at that stage, we just called the show Hipsters. And, um, you know, it was about two, two guys from Bondi who were starting a fashion label and, um, you know, trying to make the world a better place whilst clearly being part of the problem. That was their kind of central concept, but in the in coming up with the kind of um, with the bits for the for the trailer, we kind of we'd done a whole bunch of jamming over several weeks, um, and so we kind of knew the characters relatively well by then. Right. And right. so our first weekend of shooting was actually just to shoot this trailer to enter in this competition, but every little kind of bit that we started shooting on the interview couch, we just started riffing on and expanding on, and you know we had these kind of backup gags that we were going to have little different sections that would help push the trailer along in the competition. And okay. um, what ended up happening is in the process of cutting the trailer, we kind of realized we had, I don't know, eight little little kind of videos that were quite um, specifically about different comedic bits. And so we broke those videos up into different, you know, broke those things up. So we cut the main 60 second, entered that in the competition. And then across the judging weeks of the competition, we just started putting these other videos out to try and get people to vote for our trailer. But what ended up happening was the videos we'd put out around it kind of just blew up. <laughs> and, um, and so we, by the time the competition was coming around, we were kind of hoping we weren't going to win it. Because what happens if you win the contest is that that movie extra own your idea in perpetuity throughout oh, the world. Oh, one of those um, ones. Oh, right. Which we just had the experience of. By this stage, we'd finished our pilot now, and that was we were trying to actually be out there in the market and sell the pilot that we'd yeah. created for the MTV contest. And yep. we were just starting to get our heads around the fact that it wasn't really $180,000 that you won for a pilot. It was more like a $180,000 loan that had to be paid back if any network wanted to make your show. So right. it was more like a ball and chain and we probably would have been better off pitching the show without a pilot because then if some yeah. network liked it, they wouldn't have had to pay back $180,000 to Viacom. <laughs> Um, that's hard that, to walk that, into a room and pitch yeah. and say, by the way, I need one hundred eighty bucks up, one hundred eighty thousand dollars up front as well, just to, just yeah. to, just to not proceed only to the am next I level nobody, pitching. Um, you know, and not only uh, do we have no proper audience <laughs> or anything, you know, that much experience to bring to the table, 
Um, you're going to have to school us on the way through and you're going to have to pay a company yeah. $180,000. This conversation is 180K. Oh my God. And nothing nothing makes us shiver more than the, than the term in perpetuity. Oh. Oh, throughout the universe. <laughs> I think they, some of them are now saying throughout the multiverse in <laughs> perpetuity. It's like just in case there is a multiverse. Just in case that Zuckerberg's metaverse takes off maybe? I don't know. Be part yeah. of that. Who knows? But, um, so basically, you know... And then after putting those videos out with Bondi hipsters, we kind of realized that what we'd always wanted to do was kind of tell the narrative story of those two characters. And we just started the web thing as a way to kind of build their world. But we started to realize that we were like, oh, we've got a great way to just kind of like come to know who these characters are and what their story could be in a really simple, cost-effective, production-effective way by going with that mockumentary-style thing of, you know, just have them bullshit on a couch and... Uh, that gave us an opportunity to do heaps of improv, heaps of, you know, heaps of gag our way through heaps of different topics, uh, jam out lots of script ideas and then kind of work out, you know, in the edit or on the day what we wanted to put in and what we didn't. And, um, yeah. you know, we could shoot for one weekend and be able to create 12 weeks of content and then shoot for wow. another weekend and bang out another 12 weeks of content. And we did, when we started Bondi Hipsters, we set the goal of doing one episode a week for a year. And we, we did that. We did 53 weeks in a row of one video a week. That's amazing. Yeah, wow. And obviously, besides the aspect that you just mentioned, the production aspect, um, Dom and Adrian are obviously like, there's a lot of aspects to them that are quite relatable for a lot of people, especially if you live in Bondi and all that stuff. Uh, what was what was like, I guess, your guys' main attraction or inspiration to actually like make those characters up kind of thing? Well, I guess um, I'd been living... I grew up in Cronulla, but I'd been living in Bondi for a while. And I just started finding it funny that every cafe you go to, you kind of hear these guys like... It's so it's almost like nobody in that suburb worked, but everyone had eight side <laughs> yeah. projects. But you just constantly hear guys it's like just catching up for coffees with mates, going like, "Yeah, I just started my fashion label, and you know, we're putting on a festival, you know, next year, and we're trying. Gonna, I'm going to open a yoga studio, and I'm going to do this." And it's just like this constant flow of people who have these kind of entrepreneurial ideas. And I guess, I guess it's kind of funny because a lot of those. You know, a lot of those are people who have kind of like come to Bondi from other places in the country or from other places in the world. But also a lot of them are kind of like drifting private school boys who's like dads <laughs> give them money to just try and do something with their lives. Um, and so we kind of just decided, you know, Nick had spent a lot of time in Bondi too. And, um, you know, he was immediately enthusiastic about kind of jamming out these characters. And so we kind of decided through the two of them to kind of, hit both of those sides so like you know adrian is the private school boy whose dad runs macquarie bank and who's basically hopeless and um well hopeless at at trying to get a job or have a job like he doesn't really couldn't you know, couldn't run any, a bath yeah doesn't have any interest in doing that wouldn't like wouldn't fit in would find it weird um and he was kind of based a, a lot on uh, at least for me a lot of mates um from from scots that i remember when i i went to scots <laughs> for a few years um before moving to a local school in the shire but um a lot of those guys kind of went through to be these slightly hopeless adults and um and yeah, yeah Nick, I, I, think... I went to cranbrook just down the hill so there you go so i know yeah. exactly what you're talking about <laughs> and and for nick again i think he was in the north shore i think he went to barker or something like that so similarly for him you know a few of those blokes um and Dom was kind of this dude who we were just saying enjoyed the struggle of trying to remain cool and um, who was a bit more, probably a bit more like from suburban Melbourne, um, but who met Adrian on a Kentucky tour when they were traveling around and then they kind of just decided to move in together in Bondi. <laughs> but um, the I guess the core comedic idea for us was like it gave us a set of characters through which we could... Yeah, kind of take the piss out of those people who are trying to make the world a better place whilst being part of the problem. So, you know, people who want to minimise their environmental footprints but still drive Jeep Wranglers and, you know, smoke darts exactly, and exactly. Snort, snort rack on the weekends. <laughs> and then and then also um, that the, the irony, the comedic irony of, like, trying to be world famous for being underground. Yeah, which is very much the Subi kind of story, you know, the dudes who kind of go over there. And we jumped on that Subi thing a little bit because I just find I find that story and those guys so funny that, you know, that they'd just rock up to fashion shows and, you know, they'd put they'd have like rats on the stage and they're just kind of like, 
do crazy things like put their show, like the Gucci shows are being there in this hall and they just put their shows on out on the street in front of it, you know, and just, just, you know, the, the edginess level of that organisation yeah. and, it's, you know, you hear like stories about them rocking up. Doing each other, trying not to, to look, look as though they're not trying and they're trying so hard at it. Yeah, exactly. It's like people trying really hard to not try hard. Yeah. It's crazy, um, but it's true. And I guess like we, we, the comedy and the stuff that we loved was mostly character stuff. So we were just super invested in, in coming up with a couple of fun characters and really leaning in to the character side of things. And so, you know, for all of us too, it was kind of like, it was career development because, you know, um, yeah. Nick and I were jamming out stuff. Connor, my brother, was coming in and writing episodes with us. Um, Connor and I were directing the show. It was more stuff for our directing reel. Um, and then, you know, we were able to, together off the back of the web series, um, take the whole thing to the ABC and do make soulmates off the back of it. It's great. Yeah. It's like you're yeah. all primed at the same time, just right, ready to go, and all your heads together. I mean, it's like even when you were saying, just sit down on the couch and start talking, and you'd realise that there's just so much substance there that you can play with. Um, it's fantastic. Like in terms of inspiration, it's not like you had to storyboard 53 huge weeks worth of stuff way in advance. It's like let's just have a go with these characters, play. And see what see what happens. And things like things would come out of improv that would then become baked into the characters. Like that thing of like, you know, I think it's at a certain point just improvising. You know, Nick said, um, like as Adrian, he kind of goes, "Yeah, Dom, just because your dad's got a terminal illness, and, or just because your mum's got a terminal illness, and your dad's a fucking nurse." And I'm like, you know, he's a doctor. <laughs> he's a doctor, man. And then like, he's like, he's a fucking nurse, Dom. Just admit it. And and that like. That was just a piece of improv that then baked into the world that, like, Dom's mother is, has a terminal illness and his dad is a nurse who takes <laughs> care of her. And it's like these things would these things would kind of come up in improv that would then become, you know, just part of the characters' lives that we then just decided, all right, if it's in an edit in an episode one week, yeah. then that's now part of the character's life. Um, <laughs> just build it as you go, yeah. Yeah, so it kind of was how I think part of what was really fun about it was just helping to... Um, you know, don't get me wrong. There's lots of writing we were doing and lots of like lots of planning for it. But part of what was fun was just actually when you work out what's funny as you're building it, that you, your characters are just going deeper and they're kind of expanding with the world that you, you're growing online. I mean, we got really lucky with timing. You know, like this was just as YouTube was starting to blow up, and yeah. I well, think right. the amount of hours per week that are being uploaded probably like multiplied a hundredfold between when we started doing this and what it is now. But um, mm. yeah, I definitely, I definitely think um, we scored a lucky little window. Yeah, because that's my next question. You know, what, what, did you have to do a lot behind the scenes to really build that that audience initially with with the show? I mean, we worked really hard, so we were like, no money, you know, we're, and we were just, um, we're getting people together uh, based on the enthusiasm of, of making something. You know, our DOP wanted, he, he'd kind of done ads and music videos, but he wanted some comedy uh, and some scripted stuff on his reel, so that worked for him. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a sound guy, similarly, who wanted to um, get some more stuff get some more work but also he wanted to start doing some camera work so we started shifting him onto the camera occasionally and he also wanted to kind of get some producing credits so he started helping us produce some stuff and we got a trip over to um to the olympics at, at one point and took the characters over there and you know he we got him over there to help kind of run things over there so then he got an extra credit out of that and he's now a shooter producer as a career so we, we were kind of all we're kind of all using each other to some degree, like a bunch of mates who kind of collectively wanted to wanted to do different things. Um, That's great. So the time again, the timing just kind of worked out. But you know, we were working. You know, uh, we were we were cutting. Like when I say we're spitting out, shooting for one weekend and then spitting out twelve yeah. weeks of content. You know, that was twelve weeks of editing off the back yeah. of yeah. one week yeah. of shooting. Um, so there was a lot of editing time and then, you know, a lot of uploading and spreading the videos. We were kind of uploading them to Facebook, to YouTube, um, and then kind of like doing a lot of interaction in the comments sections, in character, and a lot of what was kind of like 
I think what grew the Facebook page so quickly is that people were kind of talking to us as Dom and Adrian, and we were just kind of like commenting, recommenting, re so the, the thing stayed in the feed. I mean, that was the other way we got a bit lucky growing the Facebook pages. That was just when Facebook launched Facebook video, and so they were like just pushing any video content straight yeah, to the top yeah. of the feed. Whereas now you've got to pay a fortune to reach anyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and we, we noticed that drop like, it was almost overnight that Facebook videos went from getting hundreds of thousands of views per video to just kind of you'd upload something and get a couple of thousand views unless you pay to boost it. Yeah. And then we're just kind of like, why, yeah, why are we, yeah. why are we going to pay <laughs> to do this yeah. thing? It's yeah. But um, we, yeah, we, you know, we were in a very fortunate time in terms of, uploading content to be able to reach an audience. And I think those things just shift, right? Like people are going through yeah. a fortunate time on TikTok now and people uh, have had a fortunate time on Insta. You just, it's, you know, yeah. different people who, who happen to be making content and I, at whatever time might get like in whatever platform, but I think- Right place, right time, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 100%. And so you, you dabbled a little bit, I assume, in editing then for the, for the YouTube part of your career, I guess. Um, but obviously you're also a writer and director and an actor and all that stuff. What, what do you reckon, um, what, which one do you feel most at home with? Or is that like asking what's your favorite film? <laughs> I reckon the writing, like it, it started with kind of acting being the thing that I enjoyed most and it's very much yeah. become the writing and directing thing that I've enjoyed the most. I don't, Look, I don't know how much of that is that I just see more longevity in it in the sense right. that I've had two yeah. kids, I'm old, I'm bald, my eyes are getting um, <laughs> like more and more covered in bags, I'm drinking more and more coffees every day just to stay alive <laughs> oh and I just don't want to, I don't, like I've watched my, the auditions I get sent, I've watched them change from like, you know, hunky boyfriend to like <laughs> average sad, dad, sad dad on the edge of suicide <laughs> who's going through a midlife oh, crisis. No. <laughs> um, uh, which I actually, they're the roles I really enjoy. Anyway. I mean, look, yeah, if the check clears, if the check clears too, you know, whatever, yeah. you do it. you'll still do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, no, I honestly just, I think that, I think that there's no better lifestyle for work than you and your laptop. Like, I just think it's the, it's the, it's the most heavenly way to work that you can go, you know, you can go for a surf in the morning or you can go to the beach and you can just come back and you can take your laptop anywhere. You can go sit in a cafe, you can go sit, you know, um, somewhere, you can go interstate, you can take it with you. I mean, even if you're getting acting jobs, um, you can take your laptop with you and you can be writing on set when you're kind of like, once you know you've got your lines down and you're all kind of good to go, you can sit in a trailer with your laptop. It's, and then directing, I just, I think it's the, I just think it's the actual storytelling part of it that I just really enjoy. And um, yeah, right. it's also the collaboration. Like I, I'm so lucky I get to work with my brother and I just love that process. And we're doing a bit of collaboration with my wife Adele now as well. And I love that. And um, it's, it's just, yeah, I don't know, it's just something a little more satisfying about it to me. Yeah, don't wanna, I don't want to. I don't want to like steer you guys out of acting because. No, no. <laughs> Look, it's as as uh, to survive as actors anyway. We've got to we've got to be slashies, you know, and um, to to have you even your survival job that's still in the game is is, is a great thing. I know I, I do voiceovers as well, and then I've also got I'm writing a television series at the moment, so like there's that. Amazing. So to to be in that that. And mindset change, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about more about you're in the driver's seat of um, the creative. You're, you're you're feeling a bit more in control of it, you know, when you're writing um, and you're creating at that at that end rather than at the output end when you sort of getting the script and bringing it to life as an actor. Um, to be honest, they all feed each other so well too. Like you, you actually yeah. learn so much as a actor by doing writing or directing, and you learn so much as a writer by acting or, and you know, like, and, and, and you learn so much as a director by acting and so much as a writer by directing and they all kind of like really feed each other. Yeah. I was just going to say, if, I think if, it, if, yeah, if you, if you know, if everyone knows a little bit about everything else, then you can create this awesome project because you understand each other, you know how to work with each other, you know how to talk to each other, communicate and then create this awesome project, I guess. And you kind of just know, that, like, when you're writing, you, like, know how hard you mm. work to make characters want something, like, and to go after that thing yeah. a certain way. And so yeah, you right. kind of start to realise, 
you start to realise, like, as a writer or a director, what are the things that I want out of my actors or out of my characters in the script or in the thing? And then you start to realise if you get an acting job, you're like, what is it that they want to see out of me? Like, you start to realise that, OK, this character needs to quite quite desperately be going after this thing. Or and when I first started out acting, I'd just be like, everything is the flattest fucking thing I could <laughs> just remember, remember, all, remember all the words. As mumblecore yeah. as it could be. Like, I don't know, you know, yeah. what are you, hey, man, how are you? Happy birthday. <laughs> you know, it, give me the it's gun. Funny, it's yeah. funny though you talk about it all feeding itself because you, you, you like, you know, the words are so important and you realise just how important they are but then you also realise how much can come from turning up prepared and and the improv part of it, what the magic that can happen from the improv side of it as well. So, yeah, it all feeds each other. I think um, you, you've, you've moved from online content to working with the ABC. Now, was that directly resulted to the success resulting to the success of hipsters or it was a couple of things independently yeah it was um so when we'd made sick which was our mtv pilot um connor my brother who carried a lot of the writing work on that and had studied film at um uts he formed a relationship with a script editor named greg waters um who had kind of like you know, kind of been giving notes throughout the process of sick and kind of helping, you know, bring the story out and nudge it along. And um, and Greg ended up getting a job at the ABC as a development guy, as a development executive. And so Greg was working at the ABC. He'd loved sick. He'd seen it. He'd watched Bondi Hipsters kind of do its thing. Um, and so he called us up together, you know, myself, Nick and Connor, to come in and, you know, pitch him a show. And so, we so he actually there. he actually reached out to you guys. Yeah, he just you know he just kind of Fantastic. said, look, you know, I love Sick. Of course, you know that. Um, I love Bondi Hipsters. Should we get together and chat about whether there's something we could do? Yeah. And so we went in cool. and we we pitched him, uh, I think five shows. So <laughs> we wow. went in there and we were like, all right, so we've got the Bondi Hipsters pitch. Here it is. Uh, we've got another pitch called Cavemen about, you know, a couple of guys at the beginning of time trying to kind of work their way through life's problems. We've got another pitch called Kiwi Assassins set in the, 80, in the 80s. It's kind of like buddy cop thing uh, about two New Zealand assassins sent over to Australia to protect the New Zealand's international interests. Then we've got this other idea that's called Travel Time about a time travel agency with a couple of dudes working at a time travel agency dealing with time travel conundrums. Um, well, then we got this show called Soulmates, which you basically put them all together. And then um, he was like, that one? Yeah. And at the time we thought, oh, sick, that's cool. That, like, it'd be heaps easier just to kind of like jamming out short versions of all those shows. Yeah. But it, it, it was actually like developing five shows at once because um, the, <laughs> they wanted, they, yeah, they wanted all the stories to feel satisfying. Like they wanted, so we were having to kind of learn kind of hard learn what it is to write and rewrite and rewrite and throw it out and rewrite and throw it out. Wow. And I think it was about a year and a half, the first round of development on that um, uh, before it went from like development to commission. And then once it was commissioned, it was another kind of, you know, year of hard writing to get it to the point of production. Um, so, yeah, right. you know, but that, but that's what it, that's what it takes. You, yeah. you know, yeah. you have to. People develop these skills of being able to write and craft something over a very long period of time, and so, you know, I think from the start we've always had this, for better or worse, we've always had this kind of like ethos of every single thing you make, you're learning something. Like you're just yeah. Yeah. getting better. Because I reckon there's like a whole heap of industry memes that are actually total bullshit, but they're they're in your head because people say them. Things like you're only as good as your last job. Or things like, um, you know, once you've once you've made a bad show, they'll never hire you again. Or once you've those sorts of things are like they're in your head and you feel yeah. the pressure of them yeah. on you, but they're not actually true, because yeah. you know a lot of directors who made terrible first movies go on to make amazing second films. A lot of people who are now incredible actors uh, doing incredible work have done a whole bunch of not that incredible work um, before yeah. it and. <laughs> It's not like it's a different, it's not like acting, writing and directing or any of this stuff. It's like some mystical thing that's different to any other job. It's you put in the hours. You, you know, 
Bend. There's no shortcuts. And sometimes it's easy for people to forget because they just, all they see when they turn the telly on or watch our streamer is, is the success. They don't understand, you know, the tip of the iceberg. They don't understand all the stuff that's gone in below the surface to make it happen. Shit, all, boys. All the story, boy, all the story, I've yeah. just seen that the card is full on my mic and I don't know when it got full. So I've been recording. So I'm, I'm still recording your audio coming straight into the deck, so... Got everything all that stuff happen. about oh you're professional this is professional you know what you're doing I've just <laughs> the, the perception oh, was God. there anyway you, you had had it for about 20 minutes so... we'll keep this section in it'll, it'll be funny <laughs> yeah good <laughs> good yeah so so everyone so what happened before we started recording was that I was like I've got a little uh, I've got a little mic here do you want me to record some extra audio for you guys um, and they were like oh yeah that'll be really great and I was like yeah I've got a couple of mics here yeah I've done this thing before. <laughs> And so now what has happened is my mic that I was so proud of having has got a full card. So if you're listening to this podcast and at, and at some point I just started Sound sounding terrible, changes. Um, then that's what oh, happened. Wait. Happens to the best of us. Oh, uh, there's been a couple of moments when we've forgotten to press record, but you know what? It happens to the best of us. Oh. Uh, I yeah, think, yeah, that was uh, <laughs> on the episode where Max just completely forgot to press record and we were recording for like half an hour and it's like, oh, we haven't take, been recording take for half an hour Take two was better. Take two was better. <laughs> I'm just pushing for better. I've been on a shoot where they lost the entire data for a whole day's worth of shooting. So, Oh, oh no. Yeah, someone someone went to do the card. Like they send a data wrangler back the work at the end of the day good. to the production office. And um, the data wrangler kind of taped over the existing cards and deleted the the day's worth of shooting, thinking that oh they're gone. In uh, it was just like it was a nightmare. I felt so sorry for the but like that's hundreds of thousands of dollars worth. Yeah, of that's an expensive yeah. stuff. And then they've got to redo oh, no. all of the planning and logistics. Oh my god! Maybe nightmares. that's one mistake. Maybe that's one mistake that won't get you hired again. Maybe that was. Maybe that's one of them. <laughs> that might be the one. Yeah, yeah. When we talk about those industry memes, it could be that. And I mean, mind you, you probably still get another job at some yeah. point. You just and le- learn yeah. for every job. I'm sure it would never happen again. If anything, he's got like three backups <laughs> before he even gets there. Definitely, when you're starting out, it's you actually realise how much more there is. You know than you can fit into your show and having to be really selective about the bits that do make it in and really like having to know your show that well that you can and be that confident in what it is you're creating that you can just murder weeks worth of work at any given point in time um, because (laughs) it's just better for the show. I've got Max with this completely like great idea, this script, and I've got these five unfinished scripts just sitting on my laptop and I I have, I have all these great ideas and I, they're in my head and I've got them and I struggle so much to just put it on paper in a sense. Like I just end up writing all the camera angles and I put all this stuff so I don't forget. I'm like, it starts here, it does all this, using all the technicalities and then you lose the story. <laughs> it's just, I have this idea, but do you have any suggestions like at all of like how to, um, I guess, I guess heaps of people struggle with ideas and then just getting it onto, onto the page. I reckon um, where your story starts, where your story ends, what your character wants, what your character needs are the, like, most important things to know. And if you've started writing before you know those things, you're probably starting to write too early. Um, Like, I think I like to, um, you know, originally when we first started writing, you'd see these kind of things like structural beat sheets and, um, you know, three-act structures and this sort of stuff that's very kind of like widely used within the industry. And you just push back against it going like, I don't need, I don't want this to be like every other story. I don't want this to feel like every other thing. Um, And I think that the more you do it, the more you actually realise those structural things are very helpful um, to actually just get you going. And then you can kind of throw them out as you're, going but just to know that there's a reason your story starts on this day that there's a thing that your character wants that there's a hole in your character's life that needs to be filled um and that the story is going to take them on that journey Uh, so i think like if and know what your format is like if it's a film there are you know follow those structures because they're tried and tested and then 
just do that until you've kind of got the beats of the story down and then you can move away from it if you want to but at least you'll know you'll you know that the story will be satisfying or if it's a tv show find something kind of like it you know like if it's a whodunit is it you know look at what they did with mayor of east town and kind of go oh when are we meeting the kind of suspects how is she digging the dirt on them when are those things falling um and you just start to get a sense of like what great work does to you like if you kind of analyze shows and films that you like and you kind of what what episode are they introducing antagonists what episode is the pressure really going up like what's the, you know and then t- the other thing is like if you're coming up with stuff to happen in your story like things to really happen to your characters what are they afraid of what are the like worst things in the world for them and then how can you put them through that because that's what mm-hmm. makes great story um so yeah. a friend of mine vanessa alexander who's she wrote on vikings and she wrote on the great and she's um, you know, oh, great. incredible. Yeah, so great. I mean, so yeah, great. <laughs> I didn't even mean that. Um, but you know, she was kind of saying that, like, uh, I think Da Vinci said once that he's like, you know, the the sculpture is already in the marble. I've just got to find it, kind of thing. And that's like writing. It, it's kind of like when you have the idea, like the story is there. You've kind of got to find it, not force it too much, and you'll find it by working out yeah what those those challenges you can put a character through and theme story and characters are all the same thing they all kind of end up working together and you'll you'll get to a point where your characters each kind of represent different parts of that theme um sorry i'm going on there that's I'm plenty of food for thought but, um, like i'm the worst with that too i have 38 unfinished things in my laptop but yeah, it, it's right. much more beneficial to actually just finish a thing through to completion um, even if it ends up being a bit shit just finish it get it done Finish it. And draft and draft and yeah. Yeah, and if you want to actually make something, just push it to the next point. Like that's the you can actually work on multiple things as long as you get one to the point where you're like, okay, I can send that to someone now. While while I'm waiting for them to give me notes, I can work on the next thing to this point. Mm. I can now send that thing out to producers. If get what wait until I get some feedback. In the meantime, jump on this thing and push that thing along. So you're like you're constantly pushing all these things or keeping plates spinning. And, yeah, one or two plates will fall off, but, um, you know, hopefully they all don't. You made another online series called uh, Over and Out with your wife and co-creator Adele Vuko. Um, Interestingly, or scarily, that also starred your real-life kids. It did, yeah. Well, it wasn't going to, but um, I'm just going to walk downstairs and check on said kids at the moment, actually, so that's that's what I'm doing. Perfect timing. I think Speak, speaking of kids, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, we'd written this kind of like post-apocalyptic, you know, parenting comedy that involves zombies and guns and kids and so yeah, yeah. Mad Max zombies, but with children. Um, when we kind of started figuring out how we would actually shoot it and um, how we would do some of these things, the you know people were saying to us, "There's no way in the world that any parent is going to let you." have their kid, you know, fight a zombie and stab a zombie with a knife and then eat a, you know, human foot or, um, <laughs> you know, laugh at the, get, you know, get face splattered with blood and laugh when a zombie gets his head blown off or whatever. And um, and so we started worrying that the concept was kind of going to be unachievable. And so to make things easier, also then the, sh- the shoot schedule that week right. was just quite intense. Like it was a lot of, we only had one week to shoot it and, Every single day was packed. The kids had a lot of work to do. And um, so we were just like, you know, what if we use our kids? And then everyone was like, well, yeah, that'll probably be a, be a lot easier. And so then everything in the yeah. show, like none of it was traumatising right. for them because um, they were like, when they were dealing with a zombie, it was one of their uncles. Yeah, okay. Or, you know, they got to hang out on set with us and see the person get painted a certain way. And then they're kind of one of the more crazy scenes where, one of the kids is actually knife fighting a kind of zo- a legless zombie on the ground. Yeah, that's that's my brother who was directing and his, his awesome. uncle, and we just go we just go oh go play Thor Smash <laughs> with your uncle, and so he comes out. Yeah. You know, we give him this like plastic knife, and he's just going yeah yeah. Future stunt coordinator. Get him, get him. And he's really enthusiastic and that's comfortable because it's just his uncle who he that's wrestles awesome. with all the time. Yeah, cool. It's amazing what could be born out of necessity when you've only got X amount of time. You've only got X amount of a budget. Uh, what could we do? And uh, yeah, your, your own kids are standing. That's that's fantastic. But you just you know we knew we knew we had to get that thing made because we'd worked yeah. pretty hard on it, and 
Um, it would just seem to be the only way that we'd get it made. Well done. Well, you've um, you've had it. You've had a huge couple of years. You directed a Sunburnt Christmas and and you wrote and starred in Dom and Adrian. Are you always hustling? Like you mentioned before, you've got so many plates in the air. Um, like, do you only feel like normal when you've got multiple projects on the go? Yeah, I guess I get anxious when I'm not working. I don't, maybe that's the coffee as well. Maybe, it's the <laughs> yeah. but um, I, I just kind of, I don't know. I really, I, I'm aware of the fact that I kind of came to this late. You know, it was a bit. It was, I was 27, 28 when I realised that this is something I wanted to do, and um, I just felt like I had some catching up to do, and um, I just love doing it. Like I just get a lot out of the process of having my fingers on the keyboard. I um, I love thinking ahead, going like, okay, I'm going to be unemployed in three months' time or I'm not going to have any income coming in in six months' time. How can I get ahead yeah. of that right now and start working on an idea that, that at around that time should start to generate some yeah. level of development income or something? Um, and so I just think I'm busy by necessity in that I... I just want to be busy, so I make sure that I can be by, you know, uh, several different people I collaborate with. So, you know, I'm able to kind of get something pushed along further with them where we can swap the work and I can do a bit, they can do a bit, I can do a bit, they can do a bit. That's Um, great. You know, we can take, you know, my brother and I in particular, we can take turns taking the, the lead in different things at different times in terms of keeping them moving. Um, and we often, you know, work something to a point and swap swap over our work so that the other person can pick it up from there. And, you know, we each get more excited about certain projects than others, which kind of allows us to, you know, swap things between us somewhat. Um, and I guess the more work you make, the more chance you kind of get to meet other people and then other opportunities come around where, you know, people want so you to work cool. on their stuff yeah. for them. Um, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's massive. Cool. I guess I just never rely on the fact that there will be work coming in. I'm always going to, my baseline is there'll be no work unless I make it. That's a, that's a good baseline. That's yeah. solid. I mean, especially for the, it provides the urgency, you know, to, to, to put pen to paper, to, to attack that blank page. Um, and you still, you know, thinking strategically, you got to, you got to pay the, pay the bills in six months time. And, you know, life is expectations. Like by, by taking the word unemployed and, and calling yourself unemployed actors, uh, I guess you're like, well, if, you know, worst comes to worst, exactly. I am what I say I am. <laughs> it's truth <Yeah>. in packaging, <laughs> yeah. Um, but if, if your expectation is that you're going to be super busy and, you know, have one of those crazy lightning in a bottle careers. Like I look up, the people I look up to are like Taika Waititi, who, you know, like yeah. – that guy worked fucking hard for a long time making, you know, amazing movies, a really clear voice, um, you know, flogged himself creating some really hard work. And then, yeah, he got to he got to do the awesomest thing you get to do as a director, which is to, you know, create a giant piece of work that ends up being fucking amazing. Exactly. And he hasn't, hasn't really compromised in that journey either on, on his style. His at approach. all yeah at all like and if i could have any career in the world i'd want mm. that one you know because it's just yeah. such a such a solid path but again you know i'm sure he would say that 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 hadn't the stars not aligned in a certain way that might not have happened the way that it did yeah. you know and yeah. it's you can look at these other people with these great careers and you can't really try to copy that like it's not that's not a roadmap you could never yeah. hope to think that chris hemsworth would see you know, one of the movies you made and go, that should be yeah. the guy that's going to do my next film, despite all that hard work. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. the, I just think you kind of have to just keep keep on keeping on and keep assume that nothing will land in your lap. And then if it does, it's sick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plan that's for the good. worst, hope for the best. And keep yeah. Busy. That's it. Well, Christian, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it as two up-and-coming actors. Well, lovely to meet you guys. Lovely to meet you guys. Make sure that if I ever Good to meet you um, too, man. Thanks so get much. to work on anything where, uh, you know, where you're in the right age range and all that, we're going to spin you a little audition. What like, fucking get in there? Ooh. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes, please. <laughs> take the unemployed, take the unemployed out of two unemployed actors. We'll I'm speak. only saying that because the name of the podcast. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, lovely to meet you. Cheers, Sam. Yeah, Cheers, man. This is why we did it. 
wherever you're listening to your podcasts, uh, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss more tips and tricks for actors and some behind the scenes goss. I'm Max. I'm Sam. I'm <laughs> you'll hear us, and you'll hear us next week. Bye. To unemployed actors.